Hi everyone, thanks for tuning in. Can everybody hear me okay? Let me know in the chat to the right of the YouTube video, and we will get started in about one or two minutes. All right, so let's get started. Hi, everyone, and thanks for tuning in. Uh, if you can't hear me, just let me know in the chat to the right. Um, all right, I hope everybody's staying safe out there. I am Colin White, head of research at abacus.ai, and today I'll give, be giving a talk on AutoML and neural architecture search. Throughout the talk, if you have any questions, just write them in the chat to the right of the YouTube video and I'll try to look out for them and answer them as soon as I can. And if you like what you see here today, please check out our website, which is abacus.ai. And so with that, let's get started. OK, so just a uh, motivation. So deep learning is the most prominent, prominent, prominent uh, paradigm in machine learning over the last 10 years. Um, uh, sorry, it looks like I have some background noise. Um, okay, hopefully that's better. Okay, I'm going to continue. Okay, so uh, just as some motivation, deep learning is a uh, prominent paradigm in machine learning over the last 10 years. It's seen a lot of success in uh, in applications like computer vision, natural language processing, and recommender systems, and a lot more. Um, but there's one trend where we see the algorithms are getting increasingly more specialized and complex. For instance, uh, the image here, um, there's, for instance, the, uh, the image here is uh, is DenseNet, which is an architecture that was designed for the famous ImageNet dataset, which has seen steadily, steadily uh, seen improvements over the last 10 years uh, in accuracy. So in order to see an improvement on ImageNet, we need to uh, 
make some very sophisticated neural networks, which take a lot of hand tuning and expert design. So what does this mean? Uh, will we have to get experts to, to design all our neural networks going forward, or is there another approach? Well, this is the idea of AutoML. The promise of AutoML says that we can get an algorithm to do all of this tuning for us, to search and find the best architecture, like the one on the previous slide. Um, and this is a hot area of research. Um, some people even call it the logical next step in machine learning. And AutoML is a broad term that involves data cleaning, data augmentation, automating any of the, any of the uh, parts of the ML pipeline. Um, the, uh, the two I'll be focusing on this talk are, are uh, hyperparameter optimization and neural architecture search. Okay, so I'll give a bit more introduction to AutoML, and then I'll talk about techniques for hyperparameter optimization and neural architecture search. Okay, so first I'll just talk about the differences briefly. So hyperparameter optimization is the more broad of the two, and it, it concerns finding the best hyperparameters for all parts of the uh, training phase of machine learning. This can be things like learning rate, batch size, dropout rate, and also parameters for the neural network itself, like the length of the neural network and the number of, of uh, activations in each layer. And hyperparameter optimization is typically characterized um, by optimizing real valued or categorical features. So that means that, uh, for instance, for learning rate, we might, we might look over all values between 10, 10 to the negative 5 and 10 to the negative 1. And for batch size, we might pick five uh, different numbers, like powers of 2 from 4 to 32. Uh, and meanwhile, neural architecture search is a similar concept, but it really focuses on finding the best architecture. And it can include searching over very complex search spaces, like, uh, like the graphs you see at, at the bottom of the slide. Um, so, so it'll search over these discrete structures of, of uh, directed graphs. So neural architecture search has slightly different techniques. OK. Um, so for both HPO and NAS, there are typically uh, three uh, components. The first is the search space. So before we start a uh, AutoML algorithm, we need to pick uh, the space that we're searching over. So again, for HPO, this will typically be uh, the product space of real valued or categorical features. And for neural architecture search, it's a bit more complex. We'll be searching over uh, large spaces of labeled directed graphs. Next, we, uh, we need to define the search strategy. So this is like the search algorithm that we use. It can be anything from random search to something like Bayesian optimization or, or anything else. I'll get into a lot of these techniques uh, throughout the rest of the talk. And then finally, there's the evaluation method. So most of these algorithms will involve this iterative process where we pick a set of hyperparameters or a neural architecture, and then we train it to see how it does. Basically, we like the simplest thing is allocating one hour and then returning the validation accuracy after an hour. Um, so that would be full training. Uh, and there are also more sophisticated techniques that I'll get into a bit later. OK, and uh, now I'll talk about a few uh, simpler techniques for HPO. So first, it's worth noting that you might know that neural networks are trained using gradient descent, like st stochastic gradient descent, or some other fancier techniques uh, that were developed more recently. But um, the, these methods all use gradients. So they're called first order methods because we can take the derivative of the function. But we can't do that for, our, for AutoML typically because uh, we're often searching over these discrete structures um, and you can never take derivatives for uh, discrete uh, inputs for, for where the domain is discrete. So, uh, so instead, we do zeroth order optimization. And that just means that uh, 
it's it's more of a black box optimization where we can't uh, take uh, the, the derivatives. Okay, so the simplest two algorithms are grid search and random search, as you can see at the bottom. So this is just uh, uh, taking sets of hyperparameters and trying them randomly. In grid search, it's a bit more structured. So imagine the case where we're optimizing two uh, hyperparameters, like uh, dropout rate or batch size. Then we come up with three values for both of them. And so we have nine total pairs of values total, and we just try all of them. Random search is very similar, but in, in each uh, evaluation, we pick the two uh, hyperparameters uniformly at random. And typically, random search performs better because it's very common that some of our hyperparameters are very sensitive and important, whereas others are much less so important. And random search will give us nine choices of the important parameters, whereas grid search would only give us three. And uh, But still, both of these are fairly naive. So there are much more uh, sophisticated techniques. Uh, one of them is Bayesian optimization, which is a type of adaptive search. And so in this, in this type of search, we first, first uh, perform a few evaluations and then look at the answers and then use those answers to decide what to query next. And later on in this talk, I'll discuss Bayesian optimization a lot more. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now I'll just talk about about uh, the different evaluation methods. Um, so like I said before, the simplest thing is to just uh, give every single set of hyperparameters a budget of one hour or two hours or something and run them to completion. But imagine if we, we start some set of hyperparameters and it, even after just 10 minutes, we know it's probably uh, performing pretty badly. It'll probably uh, end up performing badly. So then we could just stop it early and save a bunch of time. Um, and so there are some techniques that, that use this intuition. For instance, Hyperband by Lee et al. Uh, uses a principled method of early stopping where we start with 100 jobs and then after, after just 10 minutes we cut off the, the half the 50%, which are performing worse, the rest go for double that time, and then we cut off the uh, the bottom half again, and then so on. We we iteratively uh, double the runtime and cut half, and so then at the at the very end, we have a really good algorithm, and it's it's much more efficient. Um, but still, this approach is based on random search. Um, so if we do some sort of adaptive search will get better results. So this was a follow-up work called uh, BOHB by Faulkner et al, standing for Bayesian Optimization Hyperband. OK, so that's all I wanted to talk about for hyperparameter optimization. And, I, and I'll spend the rest of the talk going over many different methods for neural architecture search. And just as a reminder about the differences, so searching over the architecture itself can be a lot more complex because we're searching over these complex structures rather than just uh, the product space of, uh, of continuous variables. And so I'll spend a few slides talking about uh, what type of search spaces we use and, and how the research community has progressed. And then I'll get into a bunch of different algorithms for NAS. OK. so. When we're designing a search space, there's this trade-off between complexity and efficiency. So for example, we could choose to have a very, very large search space. And then there's a high chance that there will be a really good architecture in our search space for the data set we're using. But it might take a very long time to find that uh, architecture because our search space is so big. On the other hand, if we have a much smaller search space, uh, it'll be quicker to search over, but where we we might not have as varied architectures, and so we have less of a chance of finding a really good one. But there's actually a way to cheat this trade-off, which a lot of people have done in the research, and this is 
to use a small search space, but where all the architectures in the search space are very good, where the, the space is, is hand-designed to perform well. Um, and so one of the most common techniques, which is a very uh, clever technique by Zofin Lee in 2016, is to use a cell-based search space. And this is what we see on the right. So the idea of a cell-based search space uh, oh, what is going on here? Sorry about that. Um, all right, don't know why that happened. Uh, okay, so a cell-based search space is uh, we only search over a, a relatively small cell the, to the right of the photo, um, where this is a graph with about 10 nodes, where every node represents some operation. So in this, in this image, it's a, a convolutional network. And so all the operations are convolutions like uh, average three by three and pooling operations like, like max three by three pooling. Um, so the choices we have to make are setting all the operations and deciding what edges to put where. Um, so the search is over the small uh, cell, but then to get the final architecture, we stack it on top of itself many times. And there are also some more tricks, like adding some reduction layers every now and then, which are shown to get even better accuracy for uh, convolutional neural networks. OK, so um, uh, this turned out to be such a powerful technique that many, many people use this today, uh, especially in the research community. OK, so next, just to give some context, I'll talk about um, how the field progressed. So it's worth noting that these NAS algorithms take a very long time to run. In fact, the first paper in 2016, or, or technically not the first paper, but the one that sort of revitalized the field um, in 2016, used uh, 3,500 GPU hours. Uh, which is a lot. It was a paper from Google, so they had all their uh, GPUs, but, but not many people have access to that much compute. Um, so since then, the run times have steadily decreased uh, based, on, based on two reasons. One is improved search algorithms, and the second one is changing the search spaces, getting better search spaces or uh, better search spaces or or more hand-designed uh, search spaces. Um, but all, all of these changing search spaces made it very hard to compare the different algorithms. So it's really when every single technique or paper that's released uses a different space, it's hard to know whether the algorithm is better or the search space was just better. And furthermore, since the algorithms took such a long time to run, it was uh, typically, the algorithms would just be run one single time, and so it's hard to know if this algorithm is really good or if uh, we just got a lucky seed, and if we ran it again, the algorithm would perform worse. So uh, this was the state of the field up until last year, but then, uh, but then uh, there were some benchmark data sets for NAS released. So this was an effort by Google and the University of Freiburg, uh, NAS Bench 101 by Jung et al. Um, and they trained 423,000 architectures three times each and then released it as a large data set. So now when we uh, run NAS algorithms, we can, we can use this data set. So instead of taking a week to run, it'll just take about a few minutes. And so this allows us to much more easily compare different algorithms and also run enough trials to reach uh, statistical significance. Since then, there have been a few more benchmarks that were released, including one just a month ago that was uh, 10 to, size 10 to the 18 using a surrogate benchmark. All right, so now I'll talk about a bunch of different search algorithms for NAS. Um, so first I'll talk about uh, this paper that, that was basically the first NAS paper in the, in the modern era of NAS, which sort of revitalized the field. And this was a reinforcement learning technique. 
So the idea was that uh, we have a, control, a controller neural network, uh, which is a recurrent neural network. And in every round, it chooses a new architecture. And then we go ahead and train that architecture and pass the accuracy back to the controller. And then based on how high accuracy it was, the controller will update its weights. So if, if the accuracy was very high, then uh, it'll update its weights to, uh, to uh, 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 propose architectures that are similar to that one. But if it didn't do as well, then it'll update its weights to uh, not, not uh, propose architectures like that. Um, and this whole thing is set up in a reinforcement learning framework where, where it gets a reward for a good accuracy or pen penalized for lower accuracy. Um, so reinforcement learning techniques were popular for a few years, although we're not seeing as many reinforcement learning methods today because of the high uh, computational burden. Okay, so next I'll talk about regularized evolution or in general evolution type methods, which are fairly simple but very performant. So the idea is that we start out by by evaluating maybe 50 random architectures, and this will be our population. And then we look at the best architectures we have so far, and we add random muta mutations to these. And then we train the mutated architectures. And then we look at our new popu population, which is a bit bigger, and we kill off the oldest architectures. Okay, so the of course this is modeled over uh, evolution where where uh, these architectures are constantly being mutated but the oldest ones uh, die out and uh, it's worth noting that um, this can be a very powerful method but typically uh, how you do the mutations matters a lot in terms of the performance you get for instance uh, you can either do like very localized mutations or very globalized mutations, where uh, a global mutation would be changing all parts of the architecture at the same time by a little bit. And if you do too global of a mutation, then uh, it might be that everything will sort of average out and the, the actual performance stays roughly the same. But if we do too local of a, of a mutation, like we change one part of the architecture a tiny amount, then still we're not changing it enough to, uh, to get a change in accuracy. So we really want something in between local and global uh, mutations. Okay. Um, so next I'll talk about a very popular NASA algorithm, which received a lot of attention because it was such a novel approach. So uh, as, I t as I mentioned earlier in the talk, um, NAS is typically a uh, zeroth order optimization problem because we can't take the derivatives of the discrete architectures. But in this work, they found a way to cast the problem into a continuous space, and then they were able to use gradient descent. So the way they do this is, uh, if you look at if you look at Figure A here, all the places where we have a choice of operation, they added all possible operations that could go there. And each one of these operations had a variable from zero to one. And the, the variable represented the weight of that operation. And so now with this, these continuous variables that are the weights, we do have a continuous problem representing finding the best architecture. So, uh, so then we can do a bi-level optimization problem where we run gradient descent just like we're training a normal neural network, but in in every even round we'll update the regular parameters, and in every odd round we'll rep we'll we'll change the parameters um, corresponding to the architecture. So so the neural network kind of learns the best architecture and the best model parameters in parallel. And they showed that this method actually works uh, very well. There were, there were some uh, initial problems with convergence, but there's been a lot of follow-up work with this method that uh, for the most part gets rid of the 
initial problems. Okay, so next I'll talk about Bayesian optimization. And uh, Bayesian optimization is a very popular method in hyperparameter optimization because it's a very strong method for computing black box, black box functions that are hard to evaluate. Um, although they are very well set up for, for uh, imp domains in Euclidean space, although it wasn't as straightforward to apply it to NAS. Um, the first paper to do this was NASBOT by Kanasami et al. And their approach was to define a distance function between different neural architectures. Um, and the goal of a good distance function in Bayesopt is to have it be quick to evaluate, but also act as a proxy for a distance in accuracies. So if, if the distance is small, we want the accuracies of the neural network to also uh, be pretty similar. And so the way they did this was, was with a, an optimal transport function. So, so like if two neural networks are just defer by like a really small part, like one operation somewhere, then the distance will be really small. Um, but uh, technically to find the distance between two graphs, we want to do some uh, optimal transport. Um, so, so this turned out to be like a very uh, complex distance function, um, which you can read about in the paper uh, NASBOT by Kandasami et al. Okay, so then uh, with that distance function, we can uh, use the Bayesian optimization framework where we, uh, we start out by just picking a few random architectures and, uh, and evaluating them. And then we do this iterative procedure where we we look at um, all the architectures we have evaluated so far, and then make a model of, of the lost landscape and use that model to pick what new architecture we want to try next. Okay, so the key step is this uh, creating this model. And so uh, typically a Gaussian process is a very good uh, model to use with Bayesian optimization. So the idea is that we're assuming that this loss landscape is uh, is fairly smooth. Like if two architectures have a small distance, then their accuracy is probably not uh, too different from one another. Um, and then if you look on at the image on the right, so imagine that we've uh, evaluated five neural networks so far. Um, these are the five uh, blue squares here. So then we we know exactly what their loss is. And then, uh, and then we model we model this loss landscape as a Gaussian process. So, if we if we look very close to the architectures we've already evaluated, we're pretty confident we know what the accuracy might be for them. But then, uh, <clears throat> but then if we uh, um, look at the if if we go to a new space far away from the architectures we evaluated, um, we're less less sure about what the accuracy might be. So that'll be the, uh, the error regions in gray in this image. OK, so this is our model. Um, and then to choose the next architecture with our model, we use an acquisition function. And the acquisition function's job is to trade off exploration versus exploitation. OK, so if we look at the image on the right in the top panel, um, say we've queried these three architectures so far. Um, so a common acquisition function is expected improvement. Um, and in expected improvement, we try to find the architecture where on average it'll give the highest gain over the best model, over the best accuracy we've seen so far. So that'll be, that'll be this architecture right here because, uh, because it's a good blend of, uh, it's close to a, Good performing architecture, but it's also far enough away that um, there there's like a fifty percent chance that it'll that it'll be much better than anything we've seen so far. And I'll talk about uh, acquisition functions uh, a bit more later on in the talk. Okay, so uh, so yeah, so Bayesian optimization with hyperparameter tuning. 
uh, Gaussian processes worked very well, but in neural architecture search, they didn't work quite as well. And so last year, there were a few papers that came out that uh, had the idea to use Bayesian optimization, but with a neural predictor model instead of a Gaussian process. And so one of those papers was here at Abacus, um, our algorithm Bananas, Bayesian optimization with neural architectures for neural architecture search. And so the idea is that we, we train this neural predictor. Um, so, so we have this neural, this neural network, and it takes as input the architectures that we've trained so far, and, and it sees their accuracies as, as the labels. And then after we train it, it will predict the accuracy of new architectures that we haven't seen so far. And so now this is a new model for the lost landscape that we can replace with a, we can uh, have it replace Gaussian, uh, Gaussian processes in Bayesian optimization. Okay, and you might notice that there's one interesting step here, um, or one, one question, which is how do we encode the architectures? Because remember, these are all complex labeled graphs, but neural networks like to take in tensors as input. So how do we convert this complex graph to a tensor? Um, so the most uh, straightforward thing to do is to use uh, the adjacency matrix representation. So that means uh, convert this graph to a matrix where every, uh, every row and column represents one uh, node, and we add a one in every slot where, there's, where an edge exists, otherwise a zero. Um, and then since this is a labeled graph, we also need to add the labels in addition to the, uh, the adjacency matrix. OK, um, but the problem is this is a fairly challenging data structure for a neural network to interpret. For one thing, um, all, all of these features are highly correlated with one another. For instance, like an edge from, an edge from uh, the input to this 3x3 three three operation means nothing at all if we don't also have this edge uh, leading somewhere else. Like if there was no edge here, then this would just be meaningless. And also the edges are highly dependent on the, uh, the operation at each node. So, uh, so this is very complex for, for a neural network to uh, interpret and generalize. So in our work, we had the idea to define a new encoding called a path encoding. So this is uh, panel C here. So the idea in the path encoding is that we directly make a feature for every way that the data can flow from the input to the output. So if we look at this graph, there are a few different paths that the data can take from the input to the output, and we make each one of these a feature. Um, so there are four paths in this graph. So we have uh, we uh, wrote out these four paths here. And then in our encoding, uh, we put a one for if the path exists and otherwise a zero. And it turned out that this encoding uh, saw a substantial improvement in accuracy when we applied it to uh, Bayesian optimization. Um, so like I said, there were a few other papers around the same time that also had a similar approach. Some of them used uh, graph convolutional networks. Um, and this is, a, this is also an interesting approach because graph convolutional networks are sort of, uh, uh, they're designed to do well for graph data points as input. But it turns out that the path encoding even outperformed the GCNs. You can see uh, the, the best perform so, uh, so the left image is just the neural predictor by itself. And the right graph is the neural predictor added into Bayesian optimization. OK. Um, but uh, there are a few more components of this uh, Bayesian optimization plus neural predictor framework that I'll go over over the next few slides. So the first is the acquisition function, which I mentioned a few slides ago. Um, so uh, expected improvement is a very common acquisition function. But we also tried a few other common acquisition functions. And it turned out that uh, 
the two best were upper confidence bound and independent Thompson sampling. Um, so upper confidence bound is like what what is the uh, what is the architecture that has the best accuracy in the seventy five percent probability range? Um, yeah, so uh, we we made sure that we have the best acquisition function for neural architecture search. Okay, so the final uh, component of this NAS framework that we studied was the acquisition optimization strategy. And the idea here is that um, once we have an acquisition function, we, we now need to find the architecture that maximizes it. But remember, these search spaces might be very large, like 10 to the 18, so it's infeasible to try all architectures in every round. So one thing we can do that's pretty simple is just uh, randomly picking like a thousand architectures and evaluating their acquisition function. Um, so we did try that, that's the green line here. Um, but we also tried some other uh, more interesting techniques. One of them is uh, we take all the architectures we've evaluated so far and mutate the best ones just a little bit. And this turned out to perform much better. And the reason is that we had this neural predictor model and it performs best when it's on architectures that are close to the training data. For instance, like if we haven't really explored part of the search space yet, then our neural predictor won't be very accurate in that space. So it'll output predictions that are that are like maybe much too high or much too low from uh, the actual value. So it turns out that sticking close to the training data performed very well in neural architecture search. Okay, so then we were able to make our final algorithm, bananas. And on the right, we saw that it outperformed 13 other algorithms for NAS on the NAS Bench 101 dataset. And one thing that's exciting validation is that just, uh, just last month, a new, a new uh, benchmark came out, NAS Bench 301, and the authors uh, tested 10 algorithms themselves and bananas came out of top. So this is like a exciting validation that bananas is a strong technique for neural architecture search. Okay, so I'll spend a few more slides talking about some new research we've done at Abacus. Um, and this is a, a study on encodings for NAS. And this is work that we'll be presenting at NeurIPS in a few months from now, in December. So the idea here is that um, if you remember a few slides ago, uh, we designed a new encoding, um, the path encoding. Um, and there is also a recent paper that showed, that showed a slight variant of the adjacency matrix encoding, um, making the variables continuous instead of uh, zeros and ones. And they showed that this can really change the, the uh, performance of, of many NAS algorithms. So we, we conducted the first, uh, the first formal study of encodings for NAS, giving uh, theoretical and empirical al evaluations of eight different encodings. Um, four of the encodings we studied are the, are the ones displayed here. So, so there's adjacency matrix encodings we can make it a one-hot encoding or a categorical encoding. And same for path encoding. We can, uh, we can have a one-hot path encoding or a categorical path encoding. OK, so we conducted many experiments. Um, and we decided to split our experiments based on uh, NAS subroutines. So what this means is that we identified three subroutines that were sufficient to make many of the popular NAS algorithms. So the first one is a sample random architecture. So most NAS algorithms have a step where we randomly draw architectures, for instance, at the very beginning. Um, and we found that the adjacency matrix encoding had the best distribution for uh, sampling random architectures. Uh, that's this first graph here. And the next encoding was uh, mutate architecture. So a lot of uh, different NAS algorithms have a step where, where we want to mutate some of the best architectures we've seen so far. 
And so, uh, for instance, regularized evolution and local search both use this uh, operation pretty heavily. Um, so we also ran experiments uh, for this subroutine, and we saw that here the categorical adjacency matrix encoding performed the best. And finally, the, the third subroutine is a train predictor model. So this is like the neural predictor that I talked about previously, and also Gaussian processes and things like that. And for this encoding, or, or sorry, for this subroutine, we found that the path encoding substantially outperformed the adjacency matrix encoding, like in this figure and this figure. OK, so those were our experiments for uh, so, so, uh, so basically, this means that when designing a NAS algorithm, if you use any of these subroutines, you should uh, pick the best encodings based on these uh, experiments here. OK, so finally, we had a few more experiments based on the scalability and also uh, equivalence classes of the different encodings. Um, so scalability, that means like, uh, like how well do the encodings do when we truncate them smaller and smaller. And equivalence classes, well, you might notice that the uh, path encoding is not one-to-one -one because multiple architectures can map to the same path encoding. So this could be a potential problem, but we actually showed that this only happens when architectures have very similar accuracy. So you can actually think of it as a, as a feature of the path encoding. And, uh, on the, on the right, we conducted an experiment on this where we looked at the average standard deviation within equivalence classes for a different uh, length of path encoding. So over here, it's very close to zero, which is what we want. So the, it means the uh, architecture the, with the same path encoding have very similar accuracy. All right, so that's all I was talking, I was planning to talk about today. Um, just to conclude, I went over AutoML and talked about some techniques for hyperparameter optimization and neural architecture search, also talking about some of the research we're doing here at Abacus. So if you have any questions, just uh, let me know in the chat to the right. I'll, I'll stick around for a few more minutes. And thank you for tuning in.